Hey, thanks for coming, everybody, uh, especially in light of the weather. Delayed the start time a little bit because I feel like some people are maybe making some slow progress getting here, but maybe we should just go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Pete Gershon, and I work here for the Glassell School of Art. I work uh, for the core residency program, and uh, I'm really happy that you could come here to this building, which is slated for demolition at the end of August. Uh, if you didn't know, it's a really important building, and a lot of really important artists have worked and taught in this building. And so uh, when I started to conceive of this, this presentation and this panel discussion, uh, I thought it was really important to, to do it here in this, this historic space. And it's very nice to be here in the Frank and Eleanor Freed Auditorium. Frank Freed, a very important painter here in Houston, and uh, his wife Eleanor Freed, a really important chronicler of the work that happened here, writing for the, the Houston Post. And I'm, I'm looking at a lot of her writing for my research. So uh, I feel like there are some interesting synchronicities here, and uh, I'm really happy about the, the people who have agreed to come and be on this panel, and uh, I'm very grateful to all of you for making it here under these circumstances. Um, I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about um, uh, what the project is and why I'm doing it. Um, I moved here to Houston in 2005 from Vermont, where I had been publishing a jazz magazine. And uh, I continued to do that for a few years and, and have babies. And uh, then I got really sick of writing about music. And I was looking for something else to do. And I knew about these visionary art environments that we have here in Houston. Uh, and so I wrote a book about the Orange Show uh, and the Beer Can House and some of these other visionary spaces. And in the course of doing that, uh, I met some really amazing people. I met Marilyn Oshman, and I met Jim Harithis, and I met John Alexander, and I met Lynn Randolph. And in getting to know these people and interviewing them, it became obvious to me that there was a really amazing story to be told uh, about what was happening in the art scene in, in Houston in the 70s and 80s. And around the same time, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Patricia Hernandez, was working with Diane Barber to uh, get some grant money to start a project through Diverse Works uh, that was called Creating a Living Legacy. And uh, this is a project that is, is still ongoing. It's, it's into its third year now. And uh, it's a really important project that matches uh, younger artists together with older regional artists to help them document their artwork and organize their papers. And so I had the very great good fortune to be matched up with Bert Long, uh, who became a very significant figure in my life. And I spent a lot of time with Bert. And uh, Bert was a hoarder, and he never threw away anything. Uh, he was like the master chronicler of his own life. And uh, it was really incredible. I mean, we could go back to things that he had saved from the 70s, and he would put post-it notes on these things to describe exactly why something was important. And so working with Bert was really kind of like a crash course for me in learning about Houston's art history during that time. And Bert was also an amazing storyteller. And like every time I went over to his house, we like didn't even get started with the work until we had been there for two or three hours just sitting on the couch. It was a story, 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 story. So for someone like me with a background in journalism, I felt like this is just like the perfect confluence of my own interests, my interest in art, my interest in archives, my interest in, in writing, my interest in people. Uh, and so I began to feel really determined to start to gather these stories and synthesize them into a narrative uh, that could uh, tell a really important story of these times that I felt like maybe we were in danger of losing, especially once Bert passed. And I continued to explore his artwork. I just felt like I had more and more and more and more questions that I wish Bert was still around so that I could ask him, you know, why did you do this? Why did you do that? What, you know, what, what really happened with X or Y or Z? So I just feel like the time is now to document this scene as much as possible. Hello. So uh, I've been working on this book for about three years now, off and on. There have been periods where I've made a lot of progress very quickly and then some slower periods. 
Uh, but uh, over the next year or so, I am really going to push forward, and I plan to get uh, a, a lot more done. And uh, I have a, a, probably about 80,000 words uh, written right now. And so I, with this PowerPoint presentation, I just want to fairly quickly take you through some of what I've written and what I plan to write. And I'm going to keep my own remarks relatively brief about this, uh, but maybe just read you a couple of very short passages. And then within about a half an hour, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my panelists to get uh, them to talk about some of these topics so you can hear this history in their own words. So uh, a lot of people ask, uh, the subtitle of this book is Contemporary Artists Working in Houston, 1972 to 1985. And a lot of people ask, well, why is it 1972 to 1985? And the reason for that is I feel like the beginning of this particular era that I'm documenting begins with the opening of this building that's across the street. Uh, this is the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston. And this particular view of it is actually probably from about 1979 or 80 uh, because uh, you can kind of see to the right uh, the Glacell building already existing, which it didn't until 1979. But it was before the removal of this uh, amazing sculpture here uh, west of the Picos by a sculptor named uh, Rolf Westfall, who worked at the museum for a little while. Uh, if you recognize it, you've probably seen it driving back and forth from the airport where it lives now. And uh, this building opened in March of 1972. It was the culmination of a $300,000 capital campaign that began in 1967. Uh, initiated by a board member named Carrington Weems, who raised a lot of this money uh, through various benefactors in, the, in the, the Houston community. And it was designed by an architect named uh, Gunnar Burkertz, who worked out of an office in Michigan. And uh, he was tasked with designing a museum that would be a flexible space that would serve basically as an envelope for any kind of modern contemporary art that would be presented within it, whether it would be uh, painting or performance art or monumental sculpture. Uh, and so he devised this really incredible parallelogram shaped space uh, that is very long in one direction. So uh, very large works could be uh, shown in it or it could be subdivided into to smaller spaces. Um, this took place within a context of a Houston that was much smaller than the Houston that we know now. This is Houston in 1970. It's adorable and <laughs> hardly even resembles the Houston that we have now. Uh, between 1940 and 1970, uh, a, a million people were added to the population of Houston. Uh, so that was just incredible growth uh, running concurrent to the growth of the oil industry. Uh, and uh, by 1970, the population was about 1,300,000 people. In the 70s, the economy continued to, to grow, uh, partially as a result of the uh, 1973 oil embargo, which raised the price of oil, and uh, there was uh, suddenly a lot more money in Houston, uh, and uh, some of this uh, went to the arts. As early as 1971, uh, there was a, a move to, uh, that, uh, to help uh, business leaders uh, recognize that a pro-art uh, culture here was conducive to the, the city's economic growth. And, and one, one of our uh, attendees here, Diane Rudy, actually was uh, instrumental in uh, organizing the, the Main Street art happening starting in 1971. Uh, which uh, helped really lay the groundwork, I think, for a lot of what happened in the 70s later on, where uh, Main Street was, uh, a few blocks of Main Street was closed off and artwork was displayed and there was performance art and music. Uh, and I think it, it began to galvanize the, the local art scene in a way that it hadn't really been before. Uh, previous to the, the new CAM building, this is the old CAM building, that uh, was uh, designed by an architect named Carl Kamrath, and it opened in 1951, uh, originally on the, uh, the grounds of the, the park uh, downtown on uh, Dallas Street. Uh, and then uh, later on, it was, uh, this building was actually cut in half and put on uh, flatbed trucks and uh, brought to the grounds of the Prudential building on San Jacinto, uh, where they had a, a lease from the Prudential company for a dollar a year. 
And uh, within this building, uh, initially the, the, it was called the Contemporary Arts Association at the time, uh, and uh, it was a group of uh, volunteers who were advocates for the arts who self-programmed uh, the museum. Uh, among these volunteers were John and Dominique de Menil, uh, who organized a few groundbreaking exhibitions there. And then at a certain point, they invited a curator named Douglas McKaggy to come to Houston and make an assessment uh, of uh, the, the CAA's practices and make suggestions for its future and its growth. And uh, Douglas was uh, ill and he wasn't able to come, so he sent on his behalf his wife, Jermaine McKaggy, who was uh, also a museum director. Uh, and here's a picture of Jermaine McKaggy that is, a, a, it's an Instagram photo that I took at Bob's Junk where I found a St. Thomas yearbook. <laughs> and there's Jermaine McKaggy. Uh, and I feel like uh, really the modern era of uh, uh, contemporary art in Houston really started with her, uh, although certainly there were things going on beforehand. Um, there was, uh, 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 for example, an artist named McNeil Davidson who had a, a school in her a gr a outbuilding behind her house uh, where uh, Forrest Bess and Robert Prusser uh, and some other early uh, non-figurative painters studied with her. Uh, so, uh, you know, of course there, there were things happening all along, but I feel like she, she professionalized uh, this scene to a certain extent, and uh, she was very influential both uh, at the CAA, and then later when she and the De Manils moved to uh, the University of St. Thomas, where she taught art history uh, for a number of years, uh, and then a lot of the people who were in her classes, people like uh, Helen Winkler, who went on to run the, the DIA Art Foundation, uh, and Frederica Hunter and Carl Killian and people who have really become part of the lifeblood of the Houston art scene. Uh, many of these people came up under Dominique de Manil and, and um, Jermaine McKaggy. So I feel like she's she's very important for for that. And uh, and I just met, this of course goes way back before 1972. But these these are some of the people who really set the stage for what was happening in the in the 70s and 80s. Uh, she uh, after her departure from the Contemporary Arts Association. There were a few uh, short-term directors, including Donald Barclamay uh, and um, the uh, the painter uh, Robert Morris, uh, and this guy uh, Wilson Burdett, who had been some kind of business manager at the MoMA in New York. Uh, but each of them really only lasted a couple of years. They weren't really professional museum directors, uh, and uh, the museum returned for a while to more of a, a volunteer-run uh, situation and, and until the, the arrival of this man, Sebastian Lefty Adler, uh, who came here in the fall of 1966. Uh, he had uh, been, previously been the director of the Wichita Art Museum, and uh, when he came to Houston to give a talk at a conference, and Carrington Weems approached him and offered the, him the job of the directorship of the of the CAM. Uh, he refused. Uh, he said that the the uh, CAM's building was smaller than the washroom at the Wichita Art Museum. And uh, but uh, uh, Carrington took him on a, a tour of the city, and uh, eventually he he got uh, kind of excited about it, and he had sort of worn out his welcome in, in Wichita, uh, and was looking for a fresh start somewhere. Uh, so he, he came here to Houston, and um, uh, uh, upon his arrival, the Prudential uh, company uh, curtailed their sponsorship of the, uh, the, the, their landlordship of the building, and so he was left without a building. Uh, he had also insisted on a new building if he were to take the job here. So during the midst of this capital campaign, uh, there was no building for him to present shows in, so a lot of these things, uh, exhibitions that he uh, mounted, happened uh, on the uh, campus of the University of St. Thomas. Uh, but at the same time, he also was really excited about the idea of a museum without walls where he could go into the community uh, and find ways to uh, interact with uh, uh, people in, in Houston uh, in a different kind of way that the, uh, than the traditional museum experience had, had previously offered. Uh, when the building was complete, he realized that he was going to need to uh, open it with an exhibition that would make an impact and make a statement about uh, where contemporary art was uh, at the time. And so he organized a, an exhibition called Exhibition 10, 
with 10 contemporary artists who were uh, pushing the boundaries of what contemporary art was at the time. We have here a view of one of these pieces, New York City Animal Levels, by an artist from California named Ellen Van Fleet. And as you can see, this is what it was, stacked cages of rats and cats and birds and cockroaches are in the uh, glass bottles at the bottom. And uh, this didn't go over very well uh, <laughs> with the people who had, yes, yes. Someone wanted to switch the order that these animals were put up in. And she explained very scientifically that when you go into certain kinds of buildings, the order that you find these things, and they're in every building, and she had taken great care to make sure that they were placed in the order that the rats were where they belonged. And Marilyn, of course, the pigeons go at the top. And whatever, I can't remember but I'll never forget touching, being there for this moment with Ellen. That and hypnotizing the chickens, just a minute. Am I off base in saying that this, that, uh, this particular piece w uh, rubbed uh, the, the uh, people in the art scene in, in a, ne a negative way? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Earl says it smelled beautiful. It, it really caused, um, the, it was the major cause of losing at least 20% of the uh, funders who were there that night. <laughs> and Len, I'm sorry, I just have to say all this because it fits. Uh, Lynn Wyatt's husband, um, what, I can't remember his name, Oscar came in with Lynn, very excited to be at the new museum opening. And when he walked in and saw it, he said, how much did I pay to get in here? And I don't know, we answered him and he said, he said, well, I'll pay just that much again to get out and never come back again. <laughs> okay, that's a Houston quote, but true. Yeah. The opening of the Contemporary Arts Museum was a really big deal in Houston, certainly for the art community. And it was almost like a showboat coming together where the artists were outside weeks before digging that big ditch out in front, sweeping, cleaning up, patching. There's the ditch. I mean, people were out there doing all kinds of things to help this, this building come together and open on time. And I remember also that night there were... Um, blimps going over the museum, <laughs> lighting up. I mean, it was an extravaganza, very exciting. I think one of the most exciting moments in Houston's history in terms of the museum that we know, the contemporary museum that we know. Thank you, Roberta Harris. Uh, the Goodyear blimp, the light show on the Goodyear blimp was programmed by a Canadian artist named Michael Snow, uh, who's also very well known as a composer. Uh, and uh, Adler, uh, uh, the, the Goodyear blimp hangar had actually recently been moved to the Houston area, and so Sebastian Adler recognized that something could happen with the blimp, and so he suggested to Michael Snow that he create a light show for the, the display on the side. Uh, so the wave, wave transplant is the name of this piece, and it's by the only Houstonian in this particular show. Her name was Vera Simons. And uh, what she had done previously was to make these amazing uh, mylar balloons uh, that were filled with uh, helium. Uh, and she had her own solo show at the camp a couple years previously. Uh, obviously, this was a completely different kind of thing. And uh, even though the wave looks pretty good right here, uh, apparently, uh, from what you read in, in contemporary accounts at the time, is that the wave never really worked properly. Uh, I think the lining uh, kept being damaged, and so the the water drained out. Uh, I think Earl, these were some of your students, were they not? That a lot of my students were there. students from St. Thomas, yeah. students from Rice, students from University of Houston, including Julian Schnabel, worked on this. But the point of this was the point of this was for her that she 
was convinced that she could build the eternal wave. It was a wave that was not going to require anything but just being situated, the water being put in in a specific way, and that once the wave started, it was never going to stop. And of course, it never got started, and that <laughs> it did stop. So I just, it's just one of the ones that I remember. Something happened to me there, actually. <laughs> And this is, you know, I mean, I think anybody would agree, this is like very much in line with something, you know, Michael Heiser or Robert Smithson. I mean, this yes. was like very much in the vanguard of what was happening in the wider world of contemporary art, but maybe it was something that Houston wasn't necessarily ready to recognize as, as art in 1972. Yeah. Uh, well, so after, within a year from the opening of this show, Sebastian Adler was no longer the director of the Contemporary <laughs> Arts Museum, <laughs> uh, which led to a, a period of uh, about a year and a half where it was programmed by uh, Marilyn and other people working at the museum, Frederica, and, and Frederica Hunter, Frederica and Don Erdman, and a couple of other people. Uh, so during this time, there was a search for a new director, and they, they found this man here, Jim Harathis. <laughs> who had uh, been the, the director of the, uh, the Corcoran Museum in Washington, D.C., and uh, then following that at the Everson Museum in Syracuse. Uh, and uh, he was really, I would say, kind of a, a pioneer museum director. Uh, not only did he champion modern, uh, uncompromising artwork, he also uh, set up programs to work with inner city kids in Washington, D.C., uh, he uh, taught classes to uh, inmates uh, in the Syracuse area at the Auburn State Prison uh, and uh, set up a program where uh, after their release uh, they were able to show their artwork at the museum or work, at the, work jobs at the museum. Uh, he instituted uh, lunchtime classes for factory workers in Syracuse uh, so they could uh, learn about uh, modern art on their lunch break. Uh, he was just a, a real uh, proponent of uh, bringing uh, the arts uh, into the community. Uh, and uh, so I, I think he's a very important person for that and then a, a very good choice for Houston at the time. Uh, when he got here, uh, he was followed by uh, a student of his named Mark Lombardi, uh, who had uh, been in, in one of his museum management classes in Syracuse. And so Mark came down here. Uh, and uh, just sh uh, showed up at the museum and began working. He and Jim got in Jim's truck and drove all over the state trying to catalog Texas's own artists because uh, this is something that, that Jim was really excited about. Uh, they went all over the state. Uh, they went to Dallas. Uh, they went to El Paso. They went into New Mexico where a sculptor named Luis Jimenez was working. Uh, to meet with him. They went to Galveston to meet Michael Tracy. And of course, he uh, made it a point to meet as many Houston artists as he, as he could find. And I want to read to you. This was his uh, assessment when he came back from these trips and reported back to the board. He said, the museum is greatly needed for the purpose of developing support for artists working and living in Texas and that Houston could, as a result, become the major center for such activity. Having now looked at a large number of artists, I believe there's much undiscovered talent, and that Texas artists can not only compete with major artists in other areas of the country, but also make an important contribution to American art. Uh, there was also the practical matter of the, that the museum was almost bankrupt, and that these uh, kinds of shows would be very inexpensive to produce. Uh, so, um, he began with a show called 12 Texas, uh, which uh, featured among the, the 12 artists, very prominently Dorothy Hood, uh, Bob Wade, James Searles, who he had met in Dallas, Michael Tracy, as I mentioned, in, in Galveston. Here is a view of uh, a, a, a piece by uh, Bob Daddio Wade that was a, a five-pointed star uh, where he gathered uh, all this uh, uh, Texana, like uh, blue bonnets, and there was a Pachuco cross made out of uh, crushed taco shells, and uh, these armadillos, as you see here, stuff, these taxidermied animals were like a big component of his work at the time. Uh, and also significantly, 
this work by Michael Tracy called The Sugar Sacrifice, uh, he staged this ceremony in a, uh, a sugar warehouse in Galveston that was uh, owned by the, the family of one of the CAMS board members, Sissy Kempner, uh, and he found this that structure behind uh, these people is a um, like a, a fuel uh, ref, a refining like docking station, and he took one of his best paintings. He cast these spikes uh, out of a wo- like wooden splinters that he found. He he cast them in metal and then used them to uh, impale uh, one of his best paintings. Uh, and then they they placed this painting on top of the the altarpiece there with the forklifts, and uh, documented this ceremony uh, with photography. And then he he brought the platform to the museum to be displayed, and the sacrificed painting, uh, and then uh, a, a selection of these photographs, which had been uh, overpainted with the blood and and other other uh, bodily fluids, actually, and. <laughs> Uh, and so this is one of the pieces in the show. And I don't know, maybe you can speak to this, Marilyn, whether to, to what extent the board felt like after having a, a, a exhibition like Exhibition 10, were some of these pieces in this show deemed to be too much, too outlandish or not traditional enough? Or to what, to what extent uh, would you say the board was, was excited about this direction or not? I think the board, as I remember this particular thing, I remember the board being really excited to have a kind of order, uh, to kind of have a kind of order. And that this, I also believe on this particular piece, because of the different media that were used in making it, there was particular discretion used in describing the piece. And I think probably a half of the board didn't really know what it was made of. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's my opinion. <laughs> All right. It well, works better that way sometimes. So Im- immediately following this opening show, uh, Jim staged a, a long series of shows by Texas artists, many of whom had not had the opportunity to show their work in, in museums in Houston, certainly not in the, in the context of a, of a solo show. Uh, this is Luis Jimenez uh, right here, sculptures and, and drawings. And uh, just within the first three years that Jim was here, he mounted uh, solo shows of Luis Jimenez, Richard Stout, James Searles, John Alexander, Dick Ray, Terry Allen, Hannah Stewart, Forrest Prince. Julian Schnabel, who uh, had was a recent graduate of the University of Houston and he, who had to badger the museum staff to get a show, and they finally gave him one in the downstairs space. It was his first solo show anywhere. Uh, and I want to... Uh, so uh, also, I mean, it, it wasn't all just Texas artists. There was also a really important show by John Chamberlain, an amazing show by Norman Bloom, uh, a very ambitious uh, video, a show of video art by uh, um, a vi- video artist named Juan Downey. Uh, and Jim was very, very interested in video art. It was one of his major initiatives at the Everson Museum. And so he brought that here to Houston also to a, to a certain degree. Nam, Ju- Nam June Pike was one of his. Came here to Houston? Yes. And showed at the museum? Yes. There's no record of this show. Okay, well, let's talk about this. Uh, well, this is... And Sal Scarpita. And, and Sal Scarpita, yes. So, leading up to this, okay, um, Juan Downey's show is, is uh, mounted in the gallery, and downstairs uh, there was a, a show by a, a photographer named Suzanne Paul of uh, um, portraits of, of Houston artists. And... Uh, at this time, they're getting ready to uh, move into the summer with uh, a show that, that would feature a, a meticulously detailed 5 by 15 foot acrylic painting of Custer's Last Stand by artist and folk musician Eric von Schmidt, alongside photographs of the battle and its participants on loan from the Smithsonian. Herethus had recently hired, I'm reading my own writing here, had recently hired a willowy brown haired hippie named Joni Whitebird to be the museum's new curator of poetry and live performance, and in late May, she and Herethus visited with her astrologist mother to have their charts read. Distressed, Whitebird's mother warned Joni and Herethus that something significant was about to take place on June 17th. I don't know what's going to happen, she told them, but it has to do with water. 
At a board meeting a few days later, Harithus announced that while the Custer masterpiece had already arrived safely at the camp, he was putting everything else on hold. We're not making any plans until after the 17th on the advice of my astrologer. <laughs> well, on June 15th, uh, there was a, a torrential rainstorm that dropped 10 and a half inches of water on, on Houston and it flooded the Med Center. And obviously, as you can see here, it flooded the cam. Uh, this is a photograph by Susie Paul of her own submerged installation. This is a, a, the aftermath of the of the damage in the in the office, and uh, the damage was was extensive. Uh, I'll read you something else. By the rainfall's end, eight Houstonians had drowned in the deluge, and 630,000 gallons of rainwater and sewage overflow had poured down, poured down the rear delivery ramp of the cam through the loading docks and into the museum's lower gallery, offices, and storage areas, destroying not only the building's wiring, air conditioning system, video equipment, offices, and bathrooms, but also the institution's library, bookstore, and over a million dollars worth of artwork, including pieces by Max Ernst, Joseph Albers, Joan Miro, and Roy Lichtenstein that had been stored there by local art dealer Louise Ferrari. Two of James Searle's sculptures were floating in the floodwaters, two massive mural paintings by Jack Mims depicting scenes from the state's history, and dozens of Donald Shuley's wooden bone sculptures still at the museum following a show in the spring were ruined. The Ant Farm's refrigerator time capsule, uh, they made this in 1973, uh, which had never been suspended from the museum ceiling as they had hoped, had instead been relegated to the back of the storage room and had sat submerged in the murky sludge for hours. Uh, perhaps worst of all was the loss of some 200 paintings and 400 drawings by an abstract artist named Gil Quatracasas who'd shipped them to Houston in, in anticipation of a major retrospective. So uh, the, the, the damage to the building was enormous. A lot of artwork was damaged. And... Uh, Here's a, a poster that was hung up around the neighborhood. Uh, the cam, uh, the, the uh, insurance would not pay for the damages because uh, it had to do with a, a flood and, and flood damage uh, wasn't covered on, under the insurance policy. Uh, so it really looked like uh, perhaps the cam might never reopen. Here's a picture of Jim talking to uh, the governor of Texas, Dolph Briscoe and his wife. As you can see, paperwork and objects from the museum are out there drying in the sun. Uh, a lot of the paperwork uh, that uh, could be collected, some of it just washed down the drain, but what could be saved, a lot of it went to uh, NASA to be uh, freeze dried in an attempt to uh, stop uh, the development of the mold. And a lot of, the, a lot of these papers are still uh, in the archives. The CAM archives are held by the Museum of Fine Arts archives. And you look at some of these boxes, and I mean, you can't even, they're just these congealed blocks of wet papers that, that can't be read. So it's kind of a challenge for me as a researcher looking into this era that a lot of the records of the museum were, were destroyed in this flood. And so I've been trying to piece it back together through what people remember and what was in the papers at the time and what kind of papers uh, people had kept independently that, that weren't in the museum during this flood. So it's a bit of a challenge. Here's a picture that, according to Fresh Paint, uh, it, it says in the caption that it's a picture of the, the benefit auction, but I don't think that's accurate uh, because the, the benefit auction uh, was held actually at the CAM, and obviously that's not the CAM. I think this is probably a picture of a show that Jim did during, while the building was closed at Williams Tower of uh, Kachina dolls from the collection of Ann Robinson because you can see these Kachina dolls there. That's John Alexander standing in the background, and uh, Jim is shaking hands with Ed Mayo, uh, who was the registrar at the MFAH and is very much beloved by everybody. Uh, here's a drawing by Bob Wade that he provided for the benefit auction. And the list of people who donated materials for this auction uh, is really kind of remarkable. I just want to read to you. Uh, people who donated work uh, at Jim's request for this auction, William de Kooning, Robert Rauschenberg, Roy Lichtenstein, John Chamberlain, Henry Moore, John Cage, Gregory Kepes, Ed Richet, Salvatore Scarpetta, Norman Bloom, Mam June Paik, Takis, Luis Jimenez, Terry Allen, 
Locals including Richard Stout, Jack Boynton, Earl Staley, James Searles, John Alexander, Mel Chin, Jezebel Glasgow, Forrest Prince, Hannah Stewart, Dorothy Hood, on and on and on. Uh, and enough money was raised uh, through this benefit uh, to uh, fix the museum and reopen it uh, after being closed for uh, about a year. Uh, it got the museum out of the weeds and reopened, and uh, reopened with a very successful uh, show by Salvatore Scarpita, who is a particular favorite of Jim's. Uh, and uh, it, the museum seemed to be rising from the ashes like a phoenix, as if by some miracle. Uh, however, there were a couple of incidents uh, that uh, eroded uh, support that uh, Jim had from the board. Here's a photograph of the Kilgore Rangerettes. This is kind of a notorious, I was actually at Jim's this morning and we were rummaging around trying to find a videotape of the Rangerettes performance at the cam, which apparently does exist. We weren't able to find it today, uh, but we're going to keep looking for it. Uh, the Rangerettes were brought in, uh, their famous drill team uh, that uh, were engaged to perform a routine at the opening of a show by a, an artist named uh, Anthony Miralda, who uh, uh, creates sculpture from, from food. And the piece uh, in question was called Breadline. And so uh, these uh, thousands of loaves of, of dyed bread were fabricated uh, at a, a bakery here in Houston. Mrs. Baird's. Okay, Mrs. Baird's. Yes, they agreed. They couldn't understand why, but they made all these different colored breads for us. That was the beginning. All right. So the story, as I understand it, and maybe Marilyn or other people you may want, want to uh, correct me or elaborate, but uh, the idea was that uh, the, the rangerettes were going to place these loaves of bread forming a wall traversing the gallery, uh, and, uh, they, and they did this, uh, and people began uh, throwing pieces of bread, and then somebody threw a loaf of bread that hit some little girl, and so John Alexander saw the person who threw it and took the guy outside and beat him up, and it started a huge fist fight in the gallery, and the gallery needed to be cleared. The police came. Some money was stolen. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, it, it turned into a, a, a kind of a notorious incident that people still, still talk about today. Uh, so uh, also uh, there was a matter of a, a literary magazine that uh, was uh, coming together at the museum uh, that uh, the, the debut issue uh, was supposed to uh, feature the prison writings of Charles Manson and that didn't go over well with the board uh, either. Uh, I want to read something. Well, maybe I didn't mark it, but I talked to Paul Schimmel about this, and, and he said that, that uh, it was just, it, it, I, I am paraphrasing, but he said that it's, it was one of those big, bold gestures that Jim liked to do, but that by the uh, end of the incident that he thought the board was beginning to confuse Jim Harrithus with Charles Manson. <laughs> uh, but there were some really successful moments during, towards the end of his directorship. For example, here's this really beautiful uh, solar sculpture on the exterior of the building uh, by a, a sculptor named uh, Dale Eldred, uh, who constructed these uh, massive pylons with mirrors on them that directed sunlight onto mylar strips that had been applied to the outside of the building. Uh, and uh, so there were still some, some major, major successes, but uh, Jim's uh, term as director was, was drawing to a close uh, at this point. And that's the end of the first section of my book, uh, and that's the part that I, I have uh, mostly completed at this point, uh, but uh, I, it's really only about half of the work that I need to do, and I want to just tell you very, very briefly, because I want to get to the panel, uh, but uh, the rest of the book will feature chapters on the, the Houston Women's Caucus for Art, 
who uh, I feel uh, were a, a, a hugely important presence during the time. Uh, w women had a very difficult time showing their work in the 70s against the, the backdrop of this very uh, uh, macho uh, kind of attitude. Uh, Lynn is in this picture, actually, in the, in the back row, sort of towards, towards the middle. This is at the, the firehouse, uh, which still exists on, on uh, Westheimer, uh, that, that weird little curve there. Uh, which uh, is a, a building where they, they had their own, own presentations. And uh, in addition, I'm writing about uh, the uh, Lawndale Annex. This is not the Lawndale Annex. This is uh, one of two fires that preceded the opening of Lawndale. This was the fire at the art barn at U of H, which displaced the art and sculpture departments in 1979. This fire is a show at the CAM in 1979, organized by James Searles after the departure of Jim Harrithus that featured 100 different Texas artists and was a landmark event. There really had been nothing like it uh, in, in scope uh, previously bringing together the art community. And so these two things led to the, the organization of, of the Lawndale Annex. There's uh, James Searles right there with his wife Charmaine. And uh, they opened, uh, the Lawndale Annex was uh, in an enormous uh, warehouse space on the east side that had previously been a Schlumberger cable factory. Uh, and uh, uh, the U of H administration and George Bunker apologized to James Searles that, that that was the best that they could do for him and his department was putting them in this enormous warehouse, which was perfectly okay with James Searles, who realized they now had an, this huge, enormous space where they could make uh, large-scale sculpture and they could make whatever work they wanted to, completely unsupervised. <laughs> and they opened it with uh, this event called Pow Wow, which is what my book takes its name from, uh, which was organized by Searles and, and Burt Long. And uh, it featured a show of some 500 miniature works, hung salon style, just like that. And just about every single artist working in uh, Houston or te Texas or Louisiana was represented in the show. Uh, and uh, it was a, a super important experience that, that brought the community together. There's James Searles there with Burt Long and Bob Camblin at the Lawndale Annex around that time. I think that picture says a lot of the, about the era. Here's Burt in a cart that he made for a parade that they had at Lawndale. That's Lawndale in the background. That uh, um, mule uh, was spooked by the, the um, Calypso band and took off uh, running through front yards to the neighborhood, dragging Burt behind it. <laughs> Here's more from the parade, Dr. Rocket, Rock Romano. This is just, so they just decided like, okay, we're gonna have a parade. And this to me says a lot about Lawndale. Like, you know, we're just, we're just gonna do this thing. It's like, you know, Mickey Rooney, like, hey, let's, we're gonna put on a show in the barn. There's Lanny Steele, who was the, uh, the leader of a group called Some Arts that organized uh, music concerts at Lawndale, including performances by the Art Ensemble of Chicago and the Sun Ra Orchestra and the Cecil Taylor's Band. Anthony Braxton, uh, some of the Lawndale students, including, I think, Kelly and Jack Massing, for sure, and, uh, worked on these this, uh, two enormous puppets that were going to uh, be behind the orchestra performing uh, this piece by Anthony Braxton. I think they spent all semester on these puppets. Here's a show at Lawndale called A Sense of Spirit, organized by Jana Vanderlee. And uh, this is uh, some people, including Mary Genuin and, and Ed Wilson, looking at a nice sculpture by Burt Long, with some of Burt's paintings in the background. It's a picture of my friend Mary Genuin, who I like a lot. She was uh, older than the rest of the Lawndale students. She actually worked as a secretary in one of the uh, U of H offices, and so she was able to take classes for free. And so that's how she, uh, she became an artist. There's the Calypso band that played all the time there for some reason, and uh, that gives you an idea of what it looked like on the inside of Lawndale, just like this enormous industrial space. It was their rehearsal space. It was their rehearsal space. But who were these guys? I know, but who were they? Where did they come from? They were friends of a friend, and they needed a space. Okay. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> uh, 
So this set up a situation, like I'm going like much longer than I intended to, but this like set up the situation where all of these, uh, these uh, small spaces could, could flower. Oh, I actually, I do want to read you. This is short, I promise, but this is something that James Searles wrote in uh, the first Lawndale newsletter. Okay, he writes, why Lawndale anyway? Why is it important? Why is any kind of alternative space important? Because it's exciting art establishments, oh, because the existing art establishments such as the Contemporary Arts Museum, Dominique's Place at Rice, Blaffer here at the University of Houston are doing their best as it is. They simply can't do it all, and it's naive on our part to assume that they can. Let's help them, but let's also initiate some movement on our own. I believe Lawndale can accent existing points of view but in addition can present new ones. It can place a whole new set of circumstances in the middle of the art world traffic. If we have something to show, which we do, and some place to show it, they'll come look, and I believe that's important. I operate from the premise that it's as important to show art as it is to make it. I believe that if there is no one looking, it might as well not be there. I also believe that art is supposed to have a message, and when that message is transmitted and received, only then is there an exchange, only then is the circuit complete. We as artists must have more exchange. One alternative showing space is not enough. The city could support as many as five. The artwork is certainly there to see. We simply need somewhere to show it. And so within a few years, several new spaces opened, including this is the original Diverse Works. This is the Center for Art and Performance. This is the Midtown Art Center. I don't have a picture of Studio One. If anybody has a picture of what William Steen's Studio One, Jack says he does, awesome, I want to see it. Uh, this all activity culminated in 1985 with a show here at the Museum of Fine Arts called Fresh Paint. This is the front of the catalog. It was organized by uh, Barbara Rose, who at that point was on her way out as curator uh, here at the museum uh, with the, uh, the substantial support of uh, Susie Khalil, who uh, worked together to pick the artists for this show. And here's an installation view. You can see here on the left, Derek Bogier's piece, Dorothy Hood's in the middle, a screen by Joseph Glasgow. On the right is Melissa Miller's paintings. And here's Kathy Whitmire at the opening. Um, but uh, this is a, a, was a, a super important, substantial show. It was the first time that the, the museum and the, the art establishment had really recognized our own and mounted a, a, a large, ambitious show of uh, paintings by, by local artists. Uh, and uh, it seemed for a time that it might be the kind of event that would put Houston's art scene on a, on a comparable level with those of, of New York uh, and LA. And uh, it was happening right around the time of, a, of the oil bust that took some money out of the economy. So maybe that's part of why it never really happened. But perhaps one could argue that it's just as well and that it, ca it helped Houston to remain the kind of place where artists could make their own kind of work apart from prevailing trends. Uh, where, where artists could just focus on the work and live affordably, and I think in a lot of ways that is what makes the art that comes from Houston what it is. So that's mostly the end of the presentation. I'm continuing to work on this book. I'm conducting interviews with people like this, some of whom we have here. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, the, the people who are still in Houston who were involved in this scene have been uh, extremely uh, generous and open to talking with me and sharing information. And if there are people here in the audience who I don't know yet uh, but have any information that they, they want to share or maybe people who are looking at this on the YouTubes, uh, this is my contact information and I hope you'll get in touch and I'm looking for stories, memories, any kind of original documentation that uh, may have been saved from the era. And uh, that is, that uh, concludes my part of the presentation. And maybe we, like, we'll take just like a very short break while we move some things around and get my panelists up to the table. Uh, and, uh, and so maybe we'll take a break, like very short, very short. <laughs>